A very good morning to all the members of this webinar. We welcome you once again one more Master Techniques in Orthopedic Surgery webinar. Normal Orthopedic Society has been at the helm of academics for the last 50 years. This year, it has entered the portal of education with the help of webinars on learning aspects. The theme of these webinars is decision making, key decisions, getting it right the first time. Today, we have with us yet another master who is a champion of his craft. Dr. Sudhir Warrior is going to speak to us about buddy buddy bate and hand fractures. My decision making protocols. Dr. Sudhir Warrior is a renowned hand surgeon, the second in the city of Mumbai. In fact, to the Leelavati Hospital, Krishna Hospital, Hindu Hospital, and Large Clinic. So, without wasting any further time, I will now hand over the proceedings to Dr. Sudhir Warrior on his topic, Padi Padi Bate in Hand Chapters. My decision making Welcome, sir. Thank you, Swapneel, uh, and thank you, Bombay Orthopedic Society. And this is just such a wonderful way of uh, conveying a few thoughts. Well, let's uh, get on with the topic. And, uh, you know, about the hand fractures, the first thing that always comes to mind is that you just need to strap these fractures. And what happens then is you tend to do something like this, or give him a splint that looks like this, or apply something that's ready off the shelf and cause problems like this. So we need to think a little more about that. Then of course, there's the famous ball bandage, which causes more harm than good if not used properly. And it's a very difficult treatment to follow. There are many, many methods of torture and we should try and avoid these. This is just not the way to treat hand fractures. Of course, very often we jump into surgery and all we think is hand fracture means just wires. It doesn't mean wires like this. Neither does it mean wires like this. You need to know where the wires need to go in from, how far the wires need to penetrate, what position the wires need to be put in, which fractures to select for wiring, etc. So it's not just buddy splinting, not just leaving them alone to have problems like this, but it means you need to think a little more and therefore you need to have a little more idea about hand fractures. So buddy say, buddy buddy bathing. The main thing is that you need to even understand what buddy splinting is and that's uh, something that is a little rare today. So to, to try and put everything into a way in which I look at a fracture when I'm sitting in my outpatients is first to assess the fracture, then to try and see whether it needs reduction and if I can reduce it with or without local anesthetic, stabilize it. Now, whether I can stabilize it without fixing it or not, and then mobilize it right away. Then and only then am I going to achieve good union and with mobility and therefore the function is going to be restored. For all of this, the first good step is getting a good x-ray. Looking at an x-ray like this, which there is no lateral view, there are just, there's just a PA view on the right side, uh, on the right and on the left is an oblique view, not even a good oblique view and you don't really know what kind of a fracture there is. So the first thing to understand is when you send someone to uh, to, uh, to an x-ray room, this is what the lateral view is done. This is the x-ray that is done for the lateral view. The sign of making the good uh, sign or um, okay sign, which is kept on the plate and that's giving you varying angles of obliquity of the joints. If you need this to be better, such a simple thing that you need to do is to lift off the fingers from the plate and keep the fingers in varying degrees of flexion at the MP joint and look at the x-ray. Absolutely wonderful. One x-ray and all the joints are seen in their lateral profile. So you need to get this done for all your x-rays and therefore when you do look at something like this and you take a proper lateral view, 
that's the fracture that you've been missing. So the winning decision here is to get orthogonal x-rays. The second thing to do is to understand the fracture. Which bone, in, in that bone, where is it? Does it involve a joint or not? Is it displaced? Is it not displaced? And then you need to think in terms of stability. And only then you need to think in terms of fixing it. So when you're looking at stability, you'll also look for deformities which may be present or become apparent when you move the fingers, which I call dynamic deformities. So let's take a look at this x-ray. This x-ray looks like the, this is a tough fracture to fix. And it's the, it looks fairly acceptable on the view on the right. But what you must notice is the gap that is seen on the x-ray on the left that is here. And when you look at this, you do realize that there is some amount of rotation. So when you move the finger into flexion, you will see that the finger deviates and starts scissoring. So if you want to describe a hand fracture, difficulty is to try and classify these fractures. To try and to look at these, you must understand that there's a simpler way of doing it and it's a very casual, nice way. It's called the descriptive assessment. So to first talk about whether it's open or closed. So you say it's an open, the next thing you do is talk about displacement, whether it's displaced, minimally displaced, not displaced or impacted. So it's an open, undisplaced, a pattern. Transverse, oblique spiral, unicondylar, comminuted. So you describe the pattern. Then you say where in that bone it is. That is in the head, neck, shaft, base. So if you take one word from each of these and put them together, you get a good descriptive assessment of the fracture. And that's, for example, a closed, minimally displaced, oblique fracture of the shaft of the thumb or index finger, middle phalanx. So you got uh, 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 all the details in this, and it gives you an idea about how you're going to try and treat this one. Next comes, how do you try and triage these and decide which ones go in for treatment, which ones don't. So you need to first assess the stability of a fracture. And if you assess the stability of the fracture and it is stable, you can then just splint it, plaster it or strap it and start mobilizing it. But if it is unstable, then you need to reduce it first. Once you've reduced it, you can then try and splint it if it's stable now. And if not, you need to think in terms of fixation. So it's not very difficult to understand this. What is difficult is to understand what is stability. Now, unless you know what stability is, you're not going to be able to put that algorithm into use. So I like this paper from 1987, a very old paper, but absolutely wonderful paper, which talks about if the patient, when he presents to you, has 50% of movement, then it's just a number 50. It's not exactly 50. It's not 49 is bad or 51 is not bad uh, or it is very good or whatever. But it just gives you an idea that is the patient moving at least half of the range actively without too much pain, sufficient stability in motion without malrotation. Such simple things. When you look at that, and if it is true, then you can choose this fracture for a, con uh, uh, for a, a conservative treatment. Let's look at one example. Here's a fracture, whether you should fix this or not. It looks displaced, it looks oblique, it looks unstable. What if I add the fact that he's 72 years old, that he's non this is a non-dominant hand, that he has Parkinson's or say uncontrolled diabetic on blood thinners. This is going to change your decision. You reduce and assess. Then once you assessed after reduction, apply the same criteria that we spoke about. And then if it's stable, you can then treat this properly with conservative management and it will go on to good union. And that's that what happened in this patient. So don't make a decision to operate on the x-ray before seeing the entire picture of what is presented to you. Look for the lateral views for stacking up of these x-rays. If the joints look like they are stacked up one on top of the other and in the proper plane, you'll find that the fracture is well reduced. Here, it's not stacked up. The moment you reduce it, it stacks up and the joint function improves. You then need to strap it and put it into a, plaster, uh, into a uh, functional position. Body taping has to be done with thin tapes 
with cotton in between or gauze in between the fingers, no tight uh, strapping around the fingers and in the segments between the joints. Do not cover the joints. Keep the joints free to move. That's a good body strapping. After you've done that, you need to then cover the hand with a soft Gamgee roll. And once you've covered that with a soft Gamgee roll, you need to put a dorsal slab so that the hand is in a functional position with the MP joints between 45 to 60 degrees of flexion, the IP joints in extension, able to move through their range of movements. And that's the only way in which you're going to be able to get this patient to mobilize immediately after you have mobilized him in a plaster slab or fixed him with a, a wire or whatever else. If you do not fix unstable fractures, and if it's not realigned, what happens is this, that they start healing in a malposition. And because the fracture line is so close to the soft tissues, you'll find that the tendons tend to get stuck. So that's the problem with hand fractures, that the tendons are now lining almost stuck to the bones. And if there's a fracture, there's blood there, it's all going to heal, with a, it's all going to congeal and become a mass and that's going to give you trouble. So you always need to fix the unstable fractures to, in a straight line so that the flexor tendons fall off into their position, the extensor tendons go back where they need to be, not hinged or, or, or puckered or pinched between the fracture fragments and therefore they can glide and function over this fracture while the fracture is healing. So that's the whole idea. So you need to find out whether it's reducible. If it's reducible, is it stable? If it's not stable, you need to think in terms of fixing it. The decision, the winning decision here again is to keep it closed. If you keep it closed, the number of complications are much less. The adhesions are much less. The mobilization is earlier. Therefore, you need to pin it down. When you're pinning it down, what you need to do is to hold the proximal, you're dealing with the proximal phalanx of any one of the fingers push up the proximal phalanx, the proximal uh, fragment, allow it to present itself over the head of the metacarpal, then get in your wire. Once you're, you've got your wire, stay on one side or the other of the extensor tendon, which is marked here. Angle the wire in the plane of the shaft and let the wire go in. See that the medullary canal in the lateral view as seen here is completely filled up. Otherwise, you may need to stack a second wire sometimes, and you can get extremely good results with this. The extensor tendon hood may be a little bit impaled in this, but when you keep that inflection during the passage of the wire, it doesn't cause any stiffness there. What if multiple fragments are there, multiple fractures are there in proximal phalanges? Well, you just need to add some more wires, and you can do the same thing. Well, wouldn't it tug at the uh, sagittal bands, would it not cause stiffness? There usually should not be any extensor lag if you mobilize this. Early. So, what you must remember, of course, is that there should be no distraction. Phalanges do not tolerate distraction, they go into a non union. So, you've got to be very careful. Don't allow the wires to cross at the fracture site if you're putting crossed wires. First of all, the entry point of these wires are not so great. The size of the wires is completely stupid. So you've got to be careful about what size of wires you're using. Let's look at this spiral shaft fracture. There's a small gap there. That indicates rotation. So therefore, the winning decision here would be to close that gap. And so you give a little traction, derotate the fracture, you get a wonderful closure of that gap. Now, all you need to do is stabilize it because otherwise it's going to slide back. So you need to pin it down. You can use screws here. You can use wires here. After all, screws are wires with threads and heads. So whether you use one or the other, it really doesn't matter when you're dealing with sizes less than one millimeter. Here again is another fracture. And you start wondering whether this is well aligned or not. And if you look at the lateral view, you'll realize that the other phalanges are in a good lateral view, whereas this one is not. So therefore, there's rotation. And how do you make out rotation? Look end on with the MP joints flexed. Look at this. How is it? Uh, that nail looks completely tilted. And when you ask this patient to flex, sure enough, 
it's going to scissor as badly as this. So you need to fix this down. This was fixed with two wires. You can see the gap has been closed and obviously he's going to have good function. What if one of these fragments is still unstable after you passed a wire? Then sometimes you need to add another wire. And if you're passing a wire, it better be from dorsum to the volar side, not too proud on the volar side because the flexor tendons is there. So you hold this temporarily. This is not the best of fixations. You're trying to make do of a very difficult situation with a large fragment, with a large butterfly fragment. And the decision here that made the winning, uh, the, 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 the success of this fracture is to add a strategically safe wire. Remove it at two or three weeks. Once its job is done and the fracture is a little sticky, remove it and then you can get the fracture to heal extremely well. Uh, what else can you do? Well, you can use screws and this I've taken from the AO surgery reference. I don't use too many screws. I use them very occasionally and for very specific reasons and we'll see a couple of them later. So what you need to do is to divide the fracture line into thirds and then see whether there's enough space for the screw to go in. Use only one or 1 1.3 millimeter wires in Indian uh, phalanges. Anything bigger than that might split the bone and is not really useful. So you could get a very, very good hairline reduction. But remember, you've got to make such a big incision. You've got to then take care of the extensors and otherwise you're going to have a lot of complications. What else can you do for fractures that span the entire phalanx? Well, you can reduce it and then use interfrag wires, just as you would pass interfrag screws and mobilize this patient. Now this fracture is stable enough. You know you're going to impale some of the soft tissues that you can see in the center of this film, but if you mobilize them, just look at how well they do. So the decision is use your wires uh, as you would interfrag screws and immediately make it ready enough to mobilize. A similar fracture that was malunited with scissoring like we saw earlier. This is a, an osteotomy done to correct it. And once it's corrected, that's where I would use plates. I don't use plates regularly for all fractures in the phalanges for two, three reasons. One, there's a lot of dissection. You need to do, uh, you, you need to be then careful about the mobilization and see to it that these patients mobilize early enough. The size of the screws sometimes, these are one and 1.3, 1.3 and 1.5 millimeter screws. The, the, the thickness or the profile of the plate sometimes is a bit too much for very thin and slender fingers. And therefore I try and avoid them in the phalanges if I can. It's in these where I'm correcting rotations, etc. The, in an osteotomy situation that I think they are very, very handy. Let's come to the middle phalanx now. One of those very tricky bones to treat. And when you have to reduce them, sometimes you need to reduce the fracture and pass an axial wire through the tip of the finger to hold it temporarily. You don't want that wire to remain in there for long. It's a good, long, nice, stable wire. But if you're not capable of passing these two wires, as you can see in this X-ray from the sides, then maybe you can just leave the actual wire alone and, and, and mobilize them a little early and you'll find that they do fairly well. In the terminal phalanx, usually you don't need to fix a terminal phalanx shaft fracture. You need to fix other terminal phalanx fractures, which we'll see later. But in, in situations like this, where it's compound and it's, it's hinging on the soft tissues, etc., then you probably need to pin it down. And once you pin it down, you can get good results. The decision here uh, that makes it a success is that you don't cross the joint unless it's absolutely necessary. Coming to the metacarpals now, this is a fracture of the uh, neck uh, of the uh, first metacarpal, uh, second metacarpal, and it's tilted down. And you don't want that tilt. You want to bring it back up. It's like a boxer's fracture. But on the second metacarpal, what you need to do is you can use various implants, and if you're using a wire, then whether you go in retrograde or anti-grade. So you need to pre-bend a wire, create a hole, use a chuck to slowly slide the wire in, have a little curve at the tip of the wire. Once you're in, you flip the wire around, and you see how, I'm going to show that again, you see how when you flip the wire, the head comes back into wonderful position. And you can then check this in various views, 
and you'll find that the patients do extremely well. So you've got an anti-grade wire which can go for boxes fractures, which can go for other fractures. Remember the middle, the middle finger and the ring finger. When you deal with fractures like this, you need to be extremely careful because the extensor tendons, the, the, the fourth compartment extensor tendons are going to be right there. And you need to be careful about that. Let's get to avulsion fractures now. So this is a common fracture that you see in Bombay. You have these patients who travel by train, hanging on to the train with their fingertips, getting pushed out at various stations, especially if you get into a Virat train and you want to get off at Bandra or say Dadar or something like that. They don't let you do that. And when you try to do that, then you get pushed out. Your finger is stuck and your whole body weight is pulled and your FDP is trying to hold you back and it pulls off its attachment and this is called the jersey finger and this is not a simple fracture the entire fdp is attached to this fracture therefore you're not going to get movements and what you're going to see is a very blue finger completely blue pulp which when you open you can't do this close you have to open it because the fragment is flipped and you can see the flip fragment over here which needs to actually be there and that's the condyle of the middle phalanx that you're seeing so once you open it through a Brunner incision, fixing this sometimes is tricky and you can't just put screws sometimes because the fragments are already showing signs of uh, fragmentation and therefore you need to uh, think in terms of pulling it up. And to pull it up, I use a thin stainless steel wire, 26 gauge stainless steel wire pulled out from the back of the nail and tied over in a tiny knot without too much pressure and early movements can be then started because you've got a very strong stable fixation and you'll get an excellent function in these cases but beware that your Brunner incision shouldn't be in the center of the finger it should be much more this is not a very good Brunner incision i uh, i think you should take care of that so the winning decision here is to pull the tendon clear of the a4 pulley and if you do that you're clearing up the a4 pulley for actually allowing flexion of the DIP joint. So that's the whole principle of this one. Sometimes it's not that easy. There's a fragment at the back and it looks like a mallet and a jersey together. It's a comminuted. There are different names to this. Uh, this is the Buschemi type 4 jersey finger. The Leddy and Packer type 1, 2 and 3 that is uh, uh, described. But this is a fourth type. Uh, where you have an intra-articular fracture as well and here it becomes difficult. So what I would suggest in these cases is first to fix down the finger uh, with an actual wire or you can run a wire from the uh, base of the, uh, uh, the extensor surface and the dorsal lip can be pinned down first and then you go ahead and do the rest of the uh, surgery like we saw earlier, the pull out and you should get fairly good functions even in such horrible looking fractures. Let's get to mallet fingers. Mallet fractures, and I'm not going to talk too much about soft tissue mallets, but we'll just quickly look at mallet fingers with fractures. It's always tempting to try and go in and put a screw into these. Often they might heal by themselves like this. And this was treated simply by a cylinder cast like this. So it's just a small cast which you can apply. Uh, you may put a little bit of cotton in between and you can change this every week. The PIP joint is kept flexed and the DIP joint is kept extended and the patient holds it in this position while the plaster is setting. What about uh, the fractures that you need to fix? Well, if the size of the fragment is big, if it's more than 30% and things like that, you need to be careful about whether it's subluxated. So if it's subluxated, if the fragment is too far away, then, and there's no active extension, then you need to try and fix these fractures. When they come in late and they are not extending, obviously you need to fix them. So here's one which was far away and I fixed it down with a simple wire pass from the dorsum. Got to be a little careful about these wires because when you start early mobilization, they might tend to pull out or the fragment just tends to slide off on the wire. So you've got to be careful about these. The other technique is called the Ishiguro technique, where you flex the PIP, the DIP joint maximally. It pulls with it the 
fragment that's proximal down towards as long as it can come down. Then you pin down the soft tissue, the extensor tendon to the to the middle phalanx as seen here with one or two wires. Usually only one wire is good enough. And then you extend the fragment and you bring this fragment back into place and you put an, uh, another wire right through or an axial wire. So here's one where there's an axial wire. And once you hold this, you'll find that the fragments normally fall back into place. Hold this for about three weeks. You can pull out the wire, the actual wire at three weeks uh, and uh, mobilize this by four or five weeks. I borrowed this slide from Dr. Heman Patankar. He's done a lot of fixations with these. I've used a couple of screws, but I'm really not very happy. But if you have a nice large chunk, you could think in terms of using a screw for these as well. Here's a trick that I like to do in the OPD. What I do is when I see this fracture and I look at it and I see the gap and I feel so unhappy and the patient is so unhappy, what I do is I just put my finger on the gap and I look at the articular surface. Look at the wonderful congruity. I'm just going to go back to show you. I haven't done anything to this fracture. All I've done is hidden away the gap and it tells me if I treat this conservatively, if I look at the gap, I'm going to be a little worried. But if I just look at the articular surface, I'm not going to be worried. I can use a splint. This is a splint on the ring finger, but a similar splint on the thumb. And you can get an excellent result. So don't get tempted to fix all of them. Not all of them require fixation. So how would you look at mallet fingers? If there is no bony injury, we haven't dealt with that. We look at the bony injuries alone. If it's small and irreducible, if it's a reducible fragment, then you need to splint it or plaster it. If it's large, irreducible or subluxed or coming in late, you need to fix it. If you need to fix it, try closed techniques. If not, you need to open it and then fix them down. Let's look at some articular injuries of the joints below the terminal phalanx. Uh, so we are looking at now the PIP joint. Here's a displaced rotated condyle. What you need to do is to derotate it. Here in this case, what I did was used one thin wire to joystick it into place. And I was lucky in this one. And then it got the, 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 the fragment to fall back into place. The articular surface is well maintained. The middle phalanx is resting now happily on both the condyles. And I then just pin it down with 0.6 or 0.8 mm wires. That's the key to this. You need thin wires. So buy the thin wires and keep them in your set and have a drill that can take a zero chuck or a wire driver that can take it. Without that, you're not going to treat these well. And you can get very good results. You may also use screws. Now, if you're going to use screws, remember the collaterals must be retained and spared. If you pin the collateral ligaments down, because the fragment's right there, you take an incision on the lateral aspect, look for the collateral ligament, move it out, and then use your screws and use one millimeter screws here, you will be able to get excellent results too. So you, know, you see all of these fixations with screws and then you say, oh, I must use screws. And then you go in, you find this fracture, you ask for screws and you get screws, horrible screws. You get big size screws, you get cannulated screws, you get all sorts of things on your table, but be very, very selective about what you want to choose. Don't use something just because it's available. Try and use something that's useful and correct choice. So check your implants before your surgery. That's a winning decision, of course. Then we come to this where both the condyles are flipped and that's a rare one, but once it's there, it's so difficult to decide. Do I go in dorsally? Do I go in laterally? Do I go in collaterally? Very, very difficult to decide. I generally go dorsally and I go on one side of the central slip and then on the other side of the central slip, separate them out from the lateral bands. And then comes the choice of fixation. What's the harm of using K wires? No harm at all. You recreated the condyles. You just need them stable and you can fix it with that. So it's not the number of the wires. It's the size of the wires and the position of the wires. That is the decision that you need to make to keep the joints, to keep the collateral ligaments completely free 
and to allow immediate mobilization. So your wires must be strong enough in a position where you can start immediate mobilization. So the fracture is going to heal once you stabilize it and you're going to get almost 70, 80% of the movements in this joint, which was a horrible, horrible injury to start with. Sometimes it flips along with just moving out on the sides, it can flip and that one on the volar side, one on the dorsal side. So again, are you going to open it dorsally and volarly? It's already swollen. You can see the soft tissue mass there. So it's not a very, very good position there. So in this case, it's good to try and reduce the dorsal fragment by a pin by close methods. Now, all you got to deal with is the volar side. So I open the volar side, flip back the fragment, use a plate. I cut the plate. These are small plates that are available in the set with 1.3 screws. You can then try and fix it down. I turn the prongs in so the, the, the cut end of the uh, plate, the little uh, uh, edge of the plate that's there. I turn it inwards and use them as hooks as seen there and you can get a fairly good reduction then. So you recreated the joint, not the best. Again, I would hide the, uh, the joint and look at the gap and try and look at what's happening with the joint. And sure enough, from where we started, we're looking far better and you're getting a very, very good range of movements, fairly pain-free in a very, very difficult situation. An alternate technique which I got from a journal is to use the same plate from the back in a different kind of fracture, but this is a good technique to remember that you can turn these prongs and use them as hooks to try and hook the little fragments rather than try and pin them or put screws through them because they'll split. They're attached to moving tendons. You want to keep the attachment at the correct stretch. So this is a good idea. And you've got a bare surface on the middle phalanx, so it offers you that possibility. <clears throat> fracture dislocations of the PIP joint are the commonest injuries that you're going to see. So you need to understand that there is a proper collateral ligament here and you also have an accessory collateral ligament which goes down and attaches to the volar plate which is then continued down as the check rein ligaments. So once you understand this, you know that any fragment that's going to come off with a piece of uh, the collateral ligament can be unstable and it's various journals will talk or various articles will talk about whether 40 percent is involved you need to fix it down or if it's 30 percent or things like that so but what you need to understand is the stability of the joint if more than half of the joint is gone the collateral ligament remains with the, with the volar fragment the dorsal fragment has no collateral ligament and tends to then float and is then turned unstable so this uh, is an idea, gives you an idea of which fragments you want to try, uh, uh, which are the ones that you want to try and fix or not. There's a nice paper that I love to look at and it tells you the different uh, options that are available. And it also tells you in the green, those fractures which will uh, do well with uh, with what type of uh, fixation. So they, they just culled information from various uh, journals and this is something that I like to refer to by Calfi and Sommerkamp in 2009, Journal of Hand Surgery. When you're looking at these x-rays from the lateral view, then you realize that there is a subluxation. And how do you look for the subluxation? You look for the V sign. When you look for the V sign, you know this fragment is sublux. This uh, a middle phalanx is sublux backwards and when you try to flex it as I've tried here it's going to hinge at this point and once it hinges at this point you're going to start getting erosion of this bone and you're going to get arthritis of this bone so this is going to give you a little bit of pseudo flexion no gliding and it's going to give you a problem so here's one once I close reduced it there's more than 40 percent there mind you this should have been fixed but he's stable in flexion and his gliding movements have started. Now, should I fix this or should I not? Well, I sometimes tend to take a chance with these because the fragments are very tiny. 
and very difficult to fix. So if I get them gliding and I prove that it's gliding on a good lateral view like I can uh, like see here, and he's got good movements without repetis, unlike this where there's hinging and more flexion at the hinge point with opening out of that V there. So this is not good. This is going to cause trepidus, this is going to cause pain, this is not the one that you're going to conserve, conserve. You need to fix that. So if it's stable in flexion and it's gliding well, like this one, you just need to give an extension block split. So you need to block extension of the finger by using an extension block splint that overhangs and comes till here. And this is the same patient and he's gone on to heal and he's gone on to get fairly good movements. There's bound to be some amount of flexion contracture which you can stretch out and sometimes it doesn't stretch out. It really doesn't matter so much when he's got good smooth gliding movements without pain right till he can close his fist completely and get a good strong fist. What if it's unstable in flexion and it still tends to get out? Then you need to add a restraint. And that's the winning decision that you can try, put the clinoid traction, hold it down and you can get the result. You may also use external fixators to recreate this uh, once in a while, but really I would keep that as a last option and I would never ever use a distractor in that position. It's just a fix, external fixator to hold it down in place. There is, of course, these various wire devices which you can create, which all of these succeed. All of them have shown in, number, in small numbers of cases to give you good results. We did try this a long, long time ago, and we did find that a lot of our patients ended up with some infection of the K wires. And so we generally tend to avoid using this in our practice. What if they come late? Like in this case, well, he, this was what was the reduction without anesthesia. This was the reduction with anesthesia. But the surgeon decided to put an external fixator. And this is what happened. And if you look here, he is now hinging already. And the pins are too long on the volar side. The pins have gone in from the dorsal side. Now you impale the flexors, you impale the extensors, and you've got hinge flexion. What do you expect this result to be? Well, the result is obviously going to be poor because the joint is not in place and the soft tissues have been affected. So you need to now think in terms of doing some form of corrective surgery. And here the corrective surgery is very difficult because the joint is very, very poor. The joint is, uh, is, is impacted inside and by the time you bring that fragment down, it's very tiny and it's very soft and it just can't be put back together. So. There's a very, very ingenious operation devised by Hill Hastings with whom I had the chance of uh, spending a, a few years in, in Davos as a, a, a faculty together. And he just came up with this brilliant idea that the, the hamate bone has a surface that's like the PIP joint. I just can't understand how he would have looked at that and said, wow, this looks like a PIP joint. And he said, if you take this piece and you flip it and you put it in the PIP joint, you have cartilage, you have bone, and you need to fix it. And it's called the hemi hamate osteocartilaginous graft of Hill Hastings. And it's such a wonderful procedure. We've done uh, a large number of these, and they fairly usually give uniform results. Here's one being raised. That's the dorsal side. The hamate is raised. A small piece of the hamate is taken with its cartilage. This is the devastation that you see inside the joint. This is called the shotgun approach. It's a little difficult to do. But once you get the hamate bone here, you recreate the joint. You, the joint now looks absolutely normal. And if this is a patient who's come with two procedures already done with the external fixator that you can see there. And here it has reduced well and he's got almost full range of movement. So it's a really wonderful operation. It's a very technically demanding operation. And uh, uh, the number of complications that we've seen, that we've created, that we've had to deal with, and the learning curve being so steep, I would suggest that this surgery be actually reserved for the experts. But you should know that there is a possibility, and it's a wonderful, viable possibility. And the results are very, very good.
Occasionally, there are no fragments that you can actually identify, and then you need to use an external fixator. So where would I use external fixators in the hand in these days? And this is what my indication would be. But I really am left with nothing else. In those cases, I would think of an external fixator, use ligamento taxis, pin the main fragments down, and then get a good result. Don't use external fixators like this. So this is a fracture that someone saw, put a fixator on, that's a distractor. What is the need for a distractor in an acute fracture? Not really necessary. And then he went on to put a pin. He's got a good position of the joint if you look at this. But the pin has gone from the molar side. Can you imagine the FDP and the FDS being pinned down here, not allowing this finger to move? That's not a very brilliant idea. So avoid why so. That's something that you should avoid. The same kind of molar lip fracture, you have the dorsal lip fracture, and these need to be treated in extension, not in flexion. So when you pull, when you flex it, if you tend to flex this one, see what happens. It subluxates even further. If you pull it in traction into extension, it falls back into place, and the gliding surfaces then come against each other, and you won't get good gliding movement. So you need to treat these in extension. And that's what was done for this case. That's what we saw. There are what are known as knockdown. These are considered very minor. You look at this x-ray, it looks like a small fragments out there. And it doesn't seem good, but the patient is in pain. And, and this was a cricketer who was told to continue playing. And guess what happened? When we saw his x-ray, he was in pain. When we saw his x-ray and we flexed the finger, you can see that the fragment got knocked down. So the winning decision here was a dynamic x-ray. And what you need to do then is to go from the molar side, lift up the A3 pulley, push back that fragment, and fix it down with a screw. And that's him with a screw. He's continuing to play at the test level today. And he's got a wonderful, wonderful career uh, uh, restored, despite having a very, very difficult uh, injury to treat. The same thing happened in a metacarpal fracture. And here's a metacarpal fracture where the fragment has dipped down. As you can see here, it's gone down there. So it's a half of the metacarpal head. It's an intra-articular fracture. And this is pretty clear. It shows you where that fragment is lying. It's right down on the volar side. And very stupidly, I went in from the dorsal side. Should I have gone into the volar side? Well, I was a little worried about the flexor tendons and the, and the volar plate and what have you, all of that in the middle. And here on the extensor side, there's the head and the metacarpal. But where is the other piece? The other piece is down there. The fragment is down there in the volar side. Now, how am I going to get in there and reach to that and bring it back and realign it? Well, it would have been simple. And this is another case. Having learned from that one, I went in from the volar side and so simple from the volar side, don't get worried or daunted by the structures on this side. So come back to the old case. The winning decision here was to use a blunt spike to lever up this fragment, hold it with the blunt spike, pin it down from the back, and then use two screws to get this re result uh, and restore the head of the metacarpal. Quickly going through basal fractures of the thumb, Extremely common, called as Bennett's, Rolando's, intra-articular, displaced, difficult fractures. If you think about it, you know that there's flexor forces on one side, the uh, abductors uh, pulling it out on the, uh, on the dorsal aspect. So the abductor pollicis is longest from one side, the flexor pollicis from the one side. Different ways, 25 techniques listed in David Green's book. And still I prefer... <clears throat> I prefer and I tend to put, put just simple wires in uh, and get them. There are various ways in which you can pin them. And, and, and there's pin, pins that you can push through the joints or across the second metacarpal, etc. But I tend to try and rest, uh, restrict my fixations to the same fragment. But as it becomes comminuted, you may think in terms of using an external fixator or even a plate in some instances. So here's a patient who had a comminuted intra-articular fracture and I've used multiple wires and I've got a very good position. Now the thing about this fracture is the position of your x-rays because if you don't see this, you may miss the fact that it's, uh, uh, whether it's congruous or not. 
So all of them are going to work. Whatever technique you use is going to work, except, uh, so long as the congruity is maintained. And how to get a good X-ray is the winning decision here. It's spinning is simple. There's nothing there. There's just the dorsal branch of the uh, superficial nerve, the radial nerve. The one of the dorsal branches could be there, or the extensor tendons could be there, which you can easily avoid. When you take a, a P view, a PA view, this is what you see. If you look for this joint, you can't really see it. When you take a lateral view, it becomes even more difficult to see it. So how do you look at this joint? What you need to do is the Roberts pronated true AP view and look at the joint now. Absolutely congruous and you can see how to position your hand. And if you want to see the STT joints, if you want to see the scaphoid and the trapezium and the trapezoid and the base of the metacarpal, then you do a supinated view. So you do a supinated AP view and you'll find that. So these are the two views that help you to see the, con the, the congruity of the joint and whether you've reduced it and whether your pins are now in good position or not. So that's the whole idea. Compound injuries. Here's a compound injury that came to us and we treated this patient after he was primarily treated somewhere else. In this, you can see that the, the plastic surgeon who's dealt with this primarily has used an external fixator for this fracture here, has used a wire for probably a dislocation there, has used two screws or three screws for head fractures. He's used more wires there, and then he's put a plate there. So he's used fixators, he's used wires, he's used, uh, he's used plates and screws, and he's forgotten to do the basic. He's just forgotten to do a good debridement. He got carried away with his fixation. He was more interested in just getting all the bones in place. And the wound started getting infected. Every single joint was bad. And he came to us. He revised the whole thing, put only an external fixator, pulled out most of the screws, got all the skin in back in place. And it was sometime by the time we got him into a position where everything healed. Once it all healed, we looked at his function and there was no function. Everything was stuck because the best time is the first time. When you do this, you need to get them. The principle is stabilize the tissues, stabilize the bones to start immediate movement. If you don't do that, you're missing the bus. Let's look at another case. Similar case, multiple fractures, almost as numerous as the previous one. There are nine fractures in this and seven of them are uh, around the key MP joints. Now, it's going to be very, very difficult with the soft tissue injuries. External fixators from the first day, debridement and closure, soft tissues taken care of, wires left in, so there were intramedullary wires in addition to the external fixators, pulled out at the right time, None of the wires, and mind you, this is not the same patient. Mind you, none of the wires are crossing joints like this. That's a winning decision. Keep the joints pristine. Don't transgress joints unless you really need to. And what's the function? Excellent function given the injury that he had. So if you treat them well from the beginning, compound injuries need not be always ending up with stiff and dirty looking hands with no function in their joints. So if you can get them to move early, if you get them stabilized strong enough, the soft tissues to heal quick enough, put back all the soft tissues that need to be put back, you can get good results. So in summary, friends, you understood one thing, and that is the hand fractures don't just mean body splinting. Hand fractures don't just mean taking a cot splint or what have you splint. It, what you need to do when you see a hand injury in your OPD is to identify the fracture, assess the stability of that fracture by the raise and lata technique or any other technique that you think is good. Then you need to decide about splinting or fixing these fractures. The idea being to make it stable enough to mobilize the joints right away and to maintain the functional position. You will obviously need a lot of rehabilitation with splints static and dynamic so that you can get good results. Hand fractures do not mean body splinting or ball bandage. 
although it's just smaller in size, the implications are absolutely enormous. It involves badi se badi baate. So you have to be very, very careful when you're dealing with this and put in all the principles that were taught to us by our teachers who, who, who took great pains to make us understand the importance of the hand and the importance of fixing them or mobilizing them using splints, etc. So I'd like to thank all my teachers and I thank all of you for having paid that paid attention and I do hope you did get some idea of what to do when you're dealing with hand fractures. And Swapnil, thank you and thank you Bombay Orthopedic. Thank you very much, sir. That was uh, indeed a very illustrative and a very descriptive uh, lecture. And I'm sure the people who are seeing the lecture have been benefited and those who will see it in the future will also be benefited from their experience. Thank you very much, sir. And on behalf of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, I thank all the viewers for watching this webinar. And if you have any questions, you can put it in the comment section and we'll be very, very happy to forward it to our experts who will answer those questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robin.